Um, I'm really happy to be here today with you all. Um, I'm especially happy to be doing this event um, with the great um, friends and comrades we have at the Haven Center um, who have such good infrastructure for doing events like this. Um, it's not something we've ever done with the state of working Wisconsin before, but um, this year feels special and I wanna talk about why that is. And, um, but, but this panel is really the answer. I'm gonna talk a little bit, but what's special about this year is that we see evidence in the data, in the newspaper, in the people on this phone call, on, on this Zoom, um, uh, about workers expecting more from work and finding ways to demand more from work. And that's the story of 2022, I think, and um, to be celebrated this Labor Day. And so I'm really pleased to be with you all celebrating that. I want to just do the quick rundown on the state of working Wisconsin. Um, we release this report every year for Labor Day. And I uh, say with some shock and horror and pride that I've been writing this report in different ways for 27 years of my life. Um, and, uh, and that means I've written a lot of reports about the fundamental problems from working people's perspective in the way the economy works and the structure of jobs. Um, and I've written a lot of reports during very bad moments for workers um, when not only the generational 40 year kind of restructuring of corporate power in this nation, but also the cyclical fluctuations were pummeling workers. So you think about the Great Recession of 2008, the slightly less great, but still a recession of 2001, um, and, and, and the very slow recovery from those. Um, I wanna say that it took me a while to realize like, oh, 2022 looks different. And I think it's, and, and you know, that's someone who looks at the date all the time. And I think it's because a lot of us, um, you know, there is a very important, uh, 40 year restructuring about corporate power in this country and the institutions that defend workers' rights in this country. Um, and that's and that's what we've all been living in and paying attention to. But we also have a really important moment with a lot of myths attached to it that I just wanted this report to kind of break through. The first one is is this idea that the pandemic was very the pandemic made the government be super generous and all the workers looked at their jobs and said, I'm not going to work anymore. You know, the great resignation was the tagline of this last year. And I think it gave it, uh, the impression that uh, workers all over this nation were um, starting Instagram van life accounts and trying to go fund me, uh, you know, like, and just leaving the workplace and moving to the mountains. And um, uh, what has happened in the state of Wisconsin actually is we have record low unemployment rates. We have the highest number of workers we've ever had working in this state, more than 3 million workers for the first time in the May data. Um, we have... Um, the highest labor force, we have, I'm sorry, a higher labor force participation rate today than we did before the pandemic began. So in every way, this strong economy is pulling workers in. And uh, you can see that in those data. It isn't a time of retreat from work. It is a time of engagement and actually workers sort of taking this moment to recognize the power that they have in their exit right now, right? So, so that's my first kind of thing, you know, no great resignation. It was a great shuffling. It was a chance for workers to move out of work that did not work for them and move into jobs that did work for them. We see very high levels of turnover in this labor market and that's people moving up. The second thing that I think is really an important piece of um, evidence is, is wage trends. Um, this goes through 2021, and I know that the inflation of 2022 will um, kind of jumble this a little bit, but I think there's some important things to see about what tight labor markets do in wages. So we have um, uh, more than a buck 50 at the median growth in wages, inflation adjusted from 2019 to 2021, from before the pandemic to now. And, um, and 
And that level of wage growth, we haven't seen in this state since the 19, uh, late 1990s, the very tight labor markets of the late 1990s. So again, that's evidence that workers are finding ways to either move to a job that pays better or say, I can move to a job that pays better, so pay me better, right? Or employers are like, I'm gonna pay you better so that you don't move or so you don't try and form a union. We see all evidence of all these sorts of things, right? And so that's, you can see that in wages moving. Um, and then the, the, the other thing um, I think that we see moving um, is uh, workers. <laughs> and this is the other place and the reason this, for this panel um, 2022 saw a surge in um, official formal uh, workplace organizing, that is filing for elections, winning elections, those sorts of things. But I want you all to see that as part, see that as an important forefront of what workers are doing in this moment, but to see it also as connected to this entire breadth of work where individually and collectively, formally and for informally, workers are demanding more from work. And, and I think we have great examples across the, form, the levels of formality and relationship to the NLG process and uh, contracts and grievance, uh, contracts and bargaining on this call. And we have a lot of evidence just of the way that even in a state like Wisconsin, where the structure of union rules for public sector and private sector have been so brutally torn apart, see the section on unions, in, um, you know, in 2011 and slightly after for the so-called right to work bill in the state, like even in this context, workers are moving towards unions, moving towards demanding more from work. And it sets employers back. And I think it's that's the exciting thing to see. And that's what I feel like unites all this work. Um, so for, for um, I think that's plenty. That's plenty of me because there's better people on this call to talk about that part. But I think, um, oh, wait, so I'll close by saying one year of some good organizing and some good labor mar mar market opportunity does not solve a 40 year crisis, a 40 year kind of restructuring of corporate power. It does not solve the brutal inequalities, especially racial and ethnic inequalities that we document year after year in the state of working Wisconsin. It does not solve the fact that um, inequality is too woven into the fabric of the state of working Wisconsin. But it does say that when labor markets are tight and workers see their value and begin to move, work does change. And that sense of agency and leadership in the hands of workers is I think what I'm celebrating. I'm not saying like 2022 is this paradise, um, we've got so much work to do together, but we're starting to see that work. And that's, and the work, especially the collective work um, that establishes collective agreement, collective demand is the way that we will get more lasting change in this labor market. Um, and so, so that's, uh, that's how I want to close it is that, you know, this is precarious, but what gives me hope is the work them, that workers themselves are doing. So that's, um, that's plenty for me and uh, set up for uh, for the panelists that I'm so pleased are here to be with us today. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Laura. Uh, first, we're going to go to Frida, Velia, and Delia, who are with uh, Worker Justice Wisconsin and two workplaces today. Why are we going to them first? Well, Avelia, just like any good worker organizer knows, um, she needs to go and like fight, push back against the boss. So her work is never done, but we are going to hear a little bit about her work and others work as uh, proud rank and file workers in their workplaces. So Frida, by all means. Uh, hi, my name is Frida Ballard. Uh, I work at Worker Justice Wisconsin. One of the main things that we do, the main thing that we do is we help organize non-unionized workplaces. Um, so we have two campaigns currently where one one campaign is uh, mellowed out since, and I'll talk about that later, but first, um, 
our current actual campaign with Avelia um, is at a screen printing shop here in Madison. It's about 10 minutes away from our office in South Park Street. Um, so the group of workers um, were suffering mainly of two, two, uh, two main complaints, which was that they were not being paid correctly. They were being paid with bounced checks um, and not on time, incorrect amounts. And also there's an array of unsafe work conditions that we have filed with OSHA. Um, and those are the main two things that they're trying to organize around to make changes in the workplace. We fi filed a petition, uh, gave it to the boss and the boss uh, laid off the entire workforce uh, on one fell swoop. Um, thankfully the NLRB got involved immediately and they were able to reinstate their jobs the week later after three days of picketing outside the workplace um, with the support of our community and our faith and our labor allies. Um, and now I'll pass it on to Avelia to uh, talk more about uh, her experience. Entonces, si quieres tú introducirte, lo que haces, en dónde trabajas, él también va a traducir, ¿verdad? Sí. Hola, mi nombre es Avelia Sánchez. Frida me va a traducir. Uh, yo trabajo en un, una fábrica de costura. Soy costurera. Uh, yo llegué a pedir trabajo diciendo si era... Eh, si no era temporal él dijo que no, que aquí había trabajo me quedé so um, I'm interpreting for Evelia so I came uh, looking for work uh, I'm a seamstress at Crushing It Apparel the, the screen printing shop um, and I came asking to the asking the boss if there was any permanent work to be done and he said that there was okay Al recibir mi primer quincena, estuvo bien, recibí bien mi pago. En mi segunda quincena, el cheque que me dieron no tenía fondos. A un siguiente cheque no tenía fondos. Iban dos cheques, ¿verdad? Pero, bueno, ok. So, after my first biweekly paycheck, it went fine. The payment came through. The second paycheck came in and there were no funds in the check. The third Paycheck came in, there are also no funds. Cuando yo entré a esa fábrica, éramos como 16, entre 16 y 18 empleados. Empezamos a ver que se fueron, ¿cómo puede decir? Los sí, bueno. Uh -huh. Empezam, empecé, empezamos a ver mis compañeros que, que se fueron. Y el dueño discutía con ellos. Uh, después vimos que el diseñador, el que diseña las, lo que llevan las playeras, también nos dijo, salió y nos dijo que su cheque no tenía fondos y que él se iba, que él no iba a soportar esto y se iba. Peleó con el jefe y se fue, no volvió más. So when I started, there were about 16 to 18 employees there. And soon later, all the English speaking uh, American workers left. Um, and that included the designer who would make the designs for the for the screen printers for the sublimation. Um, he also got a check that bounced, um, and he decided he was not going to put up with any more, and he left. Después, pues, nos dimos cuenta que éramos todos quien había sufrido fondos, este, cheques sin fondos. Éramos todos que habíamos pasado por esa vergüenza ante el banco. Se fueron todos y solo quedamos nosotros de raza hispana. Ocho compañeros somos los que quedamos. Uh, so soon we realized that it was unanimous that all of the workers had suffered the same embarrassment and humiliation at our banks for receiving bounced checks. Um, and in the end, the only people that were left working at the factory were the Latino workers. Entonces, pues, yo... Decidí también irme. Dije, vámonos porque él ya se estaba atrasando con una quincena en nuestro pago. Y mis compañeras también decían, hay que buscar ya otro lugar porque aquí pues no, no se ve un futuro. So I just, I was already set on leaving. Um, and me and my coworkers decided that we were also going to quit. We were going to start looking for other jobs. Una compañera 
dijo, no, voy a hablar con una trabajadora social que conozco. Voy a ver, le voy a explicar lo que está pasando y, y a ver si ella me puede ayudar. Y tomó el teléfono, le llamó y esa trabajadora social le dio el número de esta organización y ahí empezó todo. <risa> ahí, okay. No, continúa. Ahí inmediatamente nos dijeron, no tienen que renunciar, es su trabajo, ustedes tienen derechos, algo que yo desconocía. Este, por favor, vengan aquí a la oficina, les vamos a ayudar. Y sí, recibimos ayuda de este equipo tan maravilloso porque realmente ellos se han movido de una forma tan inmediata que sí hemos recibido asesoría, hemos recibido, bueno, ahora sabemos que tenemos derechos. Sí. Um. So one of my coworkers first uh, said, wait, um, I might know someone that could help us. And they had a number of social worker and that social worker gave a number that was to us, to worker justice. Um, and so then we, we went to worker justice and they were able to um, immediately start working um, on this case. And that's how we learned that we do have rights, which is something that was unknown to me before. And that these are our jobs and we don't have to leave, we can defend them. Ahora, les voy a mencionar de las condiciones en las que estábamos trabajando. Eh, eran unas, el verano fue muy caliente, no teníamos aire porque el señor decía que no lo podía prender porque era gastar mucho de luz. Le pedimos ventiladores, él dijo, sí, los voy a comprar, nunca compró ventiladores. Dos veces se nos terminó el agua de botella, que nosotros tuvimos que pedir que nos comprara agua porque no había agua. El lugar es muy sucio, solo contábamos con un baño. Para en ese entonces éramos 16, 18 trabajadores, después fuimos nueve. Y él no hacía nada. Él siempre evadía, evadía, evadía y hasta la fecha nos sigue evadiendo. Y pues ahorita estamos en la lucha. So I'll talk briefly about the conditions. So we worked through the summer um, and it's very hot inside the factory and there is a centralized AC system, but the boss refused to turn it on ever because he said it would use too much electricity and he didn't want to pay that electric bill. Um, and so we bought our own fans and he said that he would buy them for us, that we would get reimbursed and that never came to fruition. Um, the uh, The whole factory is very dirty. There's only one bathroom available to the entire 18 person workforce at one point. And currently it's still the same single bathroom, but there's half the workforce. And as of, as of now, he refuses to do anything. Um, and uh, that's why we're fighting today. So yeah, we'll also connect you. Sí, bueno. Y eso es brevemente por lo que pasamos mis compañeros y yo. So that's briefly uh, what we've been through, my coworkers and I. Gracias por escucharnos también a ustedes, porque entre más voces sé que son apoyo para nosotros también. And thanks for listening to us. It's uh, very helpful to know that there's other people that are listening. Thank you so much, Evelia. Thank you, Frida. Okay, I'll move on to... <laughs> Hasta luego. Adiós. So I'll move on to... Um... The next workplace that we uh, have been working with, so it's a hotel, uh, Clarion Hotel near the Alliant Energy Center. Um, so briefly, uh, the housekeeping at, at uh, Clarion came to us. Um, they're all fairly united and um, had issues with um, several of the work conditions and especially the pay. Um, and we helped them It was a very different situation than, than the workshop um, where they're pretty cordial with us. They did sit down, they did um, listen to the workers and they did go uh, and negotiate um, a middle ground of a pay raise, a cap on rooms that had to be cleaned uh, per shift um, and some paid holidays that they got additionally. Uh, so I'll, I'll pass it on to Delia to speak kind of more about her own experience. Eh, bueno, primero, gracias por haberme invitado por acá. 
Eh, mi nombre es Delia, Delia Maestre. Eh, trabajo en el Clairos Hotel. Soy housekeeping. Eh, primero que todo, quiero dar una pequeña explicación de lo que nos motivó a estar acá. Primero que todo, este, estaba, yo soy nueva, como decir, yo tengo nueve meses trabajando algo. Me hicieron una evaluación a los tres meses. Supuestamente a los tres meses le hacen el aumento a uno. Pasaron cuatro meses, cinco meses, seis meses y nada de aumento. Llegamos al séptimo mes, nada de aumento. Yo reclamo, no, no, que, que hubo un problema en el, en el sistema. Total, a los ocho meses, puedo seguir. A los ocho meses, una compañera que también estaba en la misma situación nos habló de que teníamos que luchar por nuestros derechos. Se dirigió a, a ustedes, gracias a Dios, que nos llegó como una lucecita. Y nos habló del grupo, entonces ahí fue que empezó la batalla con nosotros para ayudarnos, ¿no? Agradecida mil veces que llegó esa lucecita, como una luz en el camino. Este, y pudimos luchar, y gracias que nos... No abandonamos el trabajo, verdaderamente muchos querían irse. No lo abandonamos porque ya teníamos mucho tiempo ahí. Amamos lo que hacemos. Y como decimos, no podemos abandonar una, un barco que ya tenemos ya entrado. O sea, luchar por lo que ya teníamos montado. So, I'll briefly explain, like, kind of what motivated us to, to do this. So, I was fairly new. I came in and I've been working there for about nine, nine months. And at nine months is supposedly when they would be giving evaluations and raises. Um, so after that, five, four, four, five months, six months went by and there was no raise, seven months, then eight months. At eight months, I raised my voice and asked about where the raise was, when it was it coming. And they said that there was some kind of problem in the system. Um, and frankly, we were also ready to leave, ready to find somewhere else. But I had another um, coworker that told us that we had to, we could fight for, for improvements. Um, and so that's when we were directed to worker justice and thankfully we're, we're very grateful for that help and we've been able to, to fight for improvements. Vamos a tener que hacerlo cortito. Ah, ok. Digo tres ya. Oh, sí. Bueno. Y para finalizar, eh, hay que decir que sí se puede, que querer es poder y que en la unión está la fuerza. Llamar a los demás para que se unan y que hagamos un buen equipo porque sí se puede. Y gracias a este grupo maravilloso que nos ayudó. And just to finalize, um, it's something that Delia has repeated over, which I really like, is quiere es poder, that if you, uh, that if you, if you want it, you can do it. Um, and that's, that's the motivating factor in all of this. Wonderful. Thank you so much again, Delia and uh, Frida. We'll hear more from Delia, hopefully, during our conversation. Of course, but now we're going to move from um, more informal settings of worker um, power and the exercise of that power to a more formalized setting uh, by hearing from James and Connor. So James and Connor, please go ahead and introduce yourselves. Hi there, uh, I'm Connor Erickson. I am a uh, event lead with the Pap Spear Group uh, here in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, our union uh, consists of event staff, box office staff, and hospitality staff that work day in and day out to operate five concert venues and two wedding venues across the city of Milwaukee. Uh, for us, organizing was a huge step towards creating job sustainability in an unreliable and deeply insecure industry uh, with growing frustration over issues such as lost hours with no compensation, and a lack of voice in the decisions that ultimately decide our safety within our workplace. Uh, our organizing began prior to the pandemic, so over two years ago, uh, with a push towards certification between March and June of this year. Uh, we had 84% of workers within our bargaining unit sign authorization cards uh, and requested that our, un uh, that our uh, employer uh, uh, voluntarily recognize our union. Uh, they did not, uh, which I don't feel is too surprising to anybody. Um, they pushed for an NLRB certified election, uh, of which we won with 92% of the vote, um, which is a, a very dominant margin that we are very, very proud of. Uh, currently, we are bargaining our first union contract with that strength uh, and with representation from the Milwaukee area 
uh, service and hospitality workers union. Uh, it's something we're very uh, proud to be a part of, and we feel like we're making a big change in the entertainment industry, not just in Milwaukee, but in Wisconsin and the greater Midwest. Yeah. Um, hello, I am James Stapleton. I am event staff at uh, the PAPS Theater Group, and Connor really hit everything. We've been organizing for a while, very underground. Um, and we went public in April of this year. And when we requested that they voluntarily recognize us, um, when they didn't, we went to a vote and we won that in, July, in June of this year. Um, and we've been bargaining for the last couple months and it's been, it's been great. We have a lot of power in this. Wonderful, welcome, thank you both. Uh, Troy, please. Hi, my name is Troy Brewer. Um, I'm 52 years old, proud father of three, Wisconsinite, probably 45 years. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, been in the restaurant and food service hospitality for over 35 years. Uh, I joined MASH a little over four and a half years ago. Uh, was never allotted that type of thing because of the type of work that I do. I'm a cook down at the Pfizer Forum and unions were never a part of what I do. So when they came to me and they brought it to me, I was shocked and surprised. But here I am four years later, I'm a chief union steward down at the Pfizer Forum uh, and a big part of everything that's going on down in the Deer District. I also went and supported the guys that uh, just formed in uh, PAPS when they were uh, unionized. I went to a couple of their rallies uh, I was a part of the collective bargaining agreement that won a historic contract down at the first contract down at the Pfizer Forum, where we made it possible for people to get paid and just have a, a better lifestyle. Uh, proud of most recently, we did mid contract negotiations, which are unheard of in, in, in our service industry, where we opened up the contract and we got even more money out of the contract that we signed the first time. So proud of that. Uh, just in the past four years, we've done a lot, including bracing up and going through a pandemic. But I believe like there's no limit to what people could do if they stand together and unify and, and stand together in solidarity. Uh, they're doing a lot of building and adding on and to the downtown area and Mass is going to be right in the middle of all of it. And I'm right there with them. I hope the boss was listening, Troy. Thank you so much for that. Next, we'll move on to Victoria. Victoria. Hi, thank you for um, letting me participate today. Um, such an empowering panel. I'm Victoria Gutierrez, and I've, I'm a nurse at uh, Meritor Hospital. We're a private sector hospital, so um, we've had collective bargaining since the time our union was formed, which was probably, I think, around the 19, early 1980s, late 70s. I've, however, only been working there for 20 years. I haven't been there. <laughs> it must have been. I've only been at Meritor for about 20 years. And I've been a proud union member for just as long. I'm involved in our nurses council there. I'm, I'm on the board of my union. I'm on the executive board of the South Central Federation of Labor and a delegate representing Meritor nurses. Um, you know, I've, I've been uh, active in the Madison labor community even prior to this job. I've had the luck of, um, being in a workplace that had a union when I worked for the city of Madison. So when I became a nurse, I knew that I wanted to <clears throat> work in a union hospital. I feel that the only way that I can really ensure my own safety or my patient's safety or provide quality care is by having that union voice. Um, this has been ex really, you know, evident kind of building up to the last couple of years. I mean, for the last 15 years, our hospital has really, even though we've had a union, has really changed culture. Um, 
we uh, changed in, in around, before Scott Walker and Act 10 and the uprising and everything, our hospital changed management and really changed the culture in the hospital. Prior to that, when I first started at Meritor, there was some semblance of kind of working together. You know, the union filled with, by the way, rank and file nurses that do the job in the hospital and management coming together. A lot of management, um, when we negotiated back then, um, were our nurse managers. Nurses, by the way, who had done our jobs and had gone up through the ranks and became management. So there was, you know, I'm not going to say it was rosy. <laughs> I mean, there was some real struggles. There was like a strike that happened, I think, in the early parts of early years of the hospital. Um, but uh, there was a semblance of really working together. That changed about 15 years ago with a CEO. And also um, our hospital became um, part of a health system, a Midwest health system, Unity Point Health, which is, I believe a tri-state um, uh, health system. There's only two hospitals. It's, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Illinois, Iowa and Wisconsin is Unity Point Health, the headquarters in Des Moines, Iowa, a right to work state. And um, and um, the all of the decisions come from out of state as well. Um, as the contract negotiations have proceeded since that time, I mean, the nurse man. There was a whole purge of nurse managers, um, and maybe that allyship. You know, when we address working conditions in the hospital that had a sympathetic voice or understood what we were saying. So those nurse managers retreated to the back of the table and then what came forward our HR. So now we bargain when we go to the table, we bargain um, against HR or with HR. Um, and, you know, these are people who are in cubicles who aren't even at the Meritor campus who aren't even nurses. Um, they aren't nurses. They don't know what we do. Um, I should also say that, you know, the union at Meritor represents, there's our bargaining unit, but there's also the service and support bargaining unit. Um, and, you know, all of this corporate healthcare in the past 15 years became, just kind of came to a head um, in 2021, when we went to the table um, for our last contract negotiation, um, the pandemic was in full swing. Um, I don't know which surge we were on, but we were in a surge. And um, that last contract negotiation just felt very different. Um, you know, we had seen footage of nurses in New York who had been wearing plastic garbage bags and taking care of patients. The whole issue of the PPE, the whole issue of transparency, the whole issue of safety, our safety, our patient safety, and all the while the patients coming in are the sickest that they, you know, uh, a deluge of really sick patients and uh, we were there holding their hand when family members weren't able to come in and do that. And, um, and then our contract negotiation started. Um, so we knew that this contract negotiation was going to be very different. As a matter of fact, from day one, I think our slogan was um, taking our hospital back. Um, and we really felt the, uh, uh, the urgency of the nursing standard here in this community, knowing the struggle that UW nurses, you know, who by the way, were our sisters and brothers in a union prior to Act 10 and, um, you know, that being destroyed, that we really felt that urgency to raise the nursing standard that going forward in this contract is negotiation, no take backs, taking the hospital back and not giving anything up. Um, 
And so I think some of the victories out of that um, were that at this time, if any of us came down with um, COVID, we had to prove that we got COVID at the hospital. This at a time when even um, employers here in Madison um, um, were giving time and money to um, their employees. So um, these are just some of the highlights and uh, thank you. Thanks so much, Victoria. And finally, Mary, presuming you can unmute yourself safely in the car. Um, please introduce yourself briefly, uh, your name, your position at your workplace and what your workplace is dealing with right now. And then we'll move on to uh, directed discussion. Hi, I'm sorry I've been late. It's been a day. Um, my name is Mary Jorgensen. I'm a nurse at UW Health. I've been there for 17 and a half years in the inpatient operating room. I've been a nurse for 25. Um, and yeah, we've just been for the last three years to have our union recognized and we're fighting. And I guess you guys all know we're going to go on strike on the 13th at 7 a.m. And that'll go through the 18th, the 16th at 7 a.m. I'm sorry. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Mary. That was a very, me? yes, oh, that okay. was very brief and perfect. Great. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, now we we're, we hope that we're going to be able to get more into these uh, stories and into your fights in more detail. Um, but first, I want to um, direct a question maybe at James and Connor um, and also to Delia. But what really struck me from Laura's introduction uh, was, you know, just how good the economy has been this past year, right? that all we've heard is how tight the labor market is, which then is contributing to inflation because apparently workers are asking for too much. Um, so it, it, let's, let's assume that narrative is true. Why did you all decide to stick around? At, why did you decide to stick in these jobs and actually take on the task, the heavy lift of organizing your workplaces rather than just leaving the job and finding something better. I would really love to hear from both James, Connor, and Delia on this point. Yeah, I can, I can speak to that for, uh, for James and I, and James obviously can, can chime in if you'd like. Um, it's been a point that we, we've, we've discussed a lot in our organization efforts of, we, in, in the industry that we exist in, in the, in the entertainment and arts, uh, industry and culture that exists in Milwaukee, uh, we have the, uh, the, the, the fortune of being able to do what we love uh, dearly and sincerely um, a, a, every day. It, it's easy to say that a, a place you work is not working for you and therefore you need to move on. It's, it's hard to do that when what you do for a living is something you care about so deeply. Um, we have a passion for for the arts and culture in Milwaukee. Uh, we have a passion for the arts and culture uh, industry as a whole. Um, and so it, it the, the idea that just because our workplace isn't great right now, uh, that we should move on just it, it never, I don't think it really fully crossed our minds. Um, we had the opportunity now to uh, to work with those at Pfizer um, and, and more uh, entertainment venues to come to create uh, a culture in Milwaukee that cares about its entertainment workers and cares about creating a safe and and quality entertainment space in the city and being one of the first cities to really do so. Um, so I, I I think what it comes down to truly is just passion for the industry, passion for the people, uh, and passion for our jobs. Yeah, I just want to tack on to that, that for me, this is a whole lot more than just, than just our workplace or even just the entertainment industry, but workers' rights 
as a whole. Um, I feel very strongly in support of unions. Obviously, I wouldn't be organizing a union if I didn't feel so uh, strongly in support of them. Um, and as soon as I, I learned that we were organizing a union at Pabst, I was like, yes, get me on that because every worker deserves the right to good wages, a good workplace, and to have a voice in in their workplace because at the end of the day it's it's us the workers who are making it all happen so we we should have a, a more a much more fair power balance than what it has been historically everywhere um yeah thank you so much james and connor uh delia and frida so delia basically talked about um so it was a lot of it was she, she's new. She was there only, you know, less than a year. Um, but many of the workers at the hotel had been there for two decades, had been there for 10, 20 years. They're very comfortable in their work. They're experts in it. They knew how to do it well. Um, and they, you know, there were there were some push, push and pull between the supervisors and the workers. But overall, their conditions were pretty good. They were paid regularly. They were paid um, on time, the correct amount. So it's a it's a stable job and for immigrant workers that, that's something that you really need to hold on to when you find it and so for them it was worth fighting for because uh, the the labor market is more limited for immigrant workers um uh, so something that is where they like their coworkers, where they generally like the work and the supervisors even if it's okay um there's always something that you can do to make it better um, and if they all had the solidarity, it's definitely possible and it's worth fighting for. It's um, really beautiful to hear the commonality of these themes across such different places. And I think we often think, oh, these are all different. You know, these are different things and we consider them at different times and um, having you all together. I, I know that a lot of people have been talking about what what this moment, why 2022, there's a kind, why there has been so much labor um, kind of organizing and worker demand in 2022. And there's a series of different answers that I think people go to, but I thought we, um, Adrian and I in this next section, will try and dig into some of those questions. And I want to start um, really with Mary and Vic thinking about um, how the pandemic, and, and Vic, you sort of started this, like how the pandemic kind of changed the meaning of uh, what you were, what the service that you were providing and, and, and the threat of your work. But I wonder like how you think about is how the pandemic has changed what it's like to organize the sense of solidarity with other workers, the sense of urgency or not where you think. So, um, Mary and Dick, which, whichever wants to step in. I'll start since I'm so late and I feel terrible. Um, so at UW, we've had, you know, deteriorating um, working conditions since we lost our contract in 2014. So in 2019, we started, we collected our, you know, 1500 cards or strong majority. Then the pandemic hit and we really had to put it on hold. So the pandemic just exacerbated all the problems that we did have. Um, one thing is, is when we did start organizing again last year, coming through and out of the pandemic, it really made us all um, kind of bond as human beings over it. Um, ooh, management would always try to pit each other again, pit, pit each department against each other. And after, after that, like, this is not our problem. This is management's problem and we need to stick together because we need to make things better in this hospital for our patients so i certainly don't want to say no i won't even say the pandemic was a blessing but it really um kick-started um our strong campaign to um get recognition once again yeah i mean i think I agree completely and wholeheartedly. I mean, these issues existed before the pandemic. The pandemic, like Mary said, just exacerbated it and also just kind of showed their hand about 
um, you know, corporate healthcare, you know, that their profit is really what they care about. You know, they don't care about our safety. They don't care about, you know, the fact that we don't know how much PPE there is. And, you know, we're asking you these questions or whether it's a plastic garbage bag or not, or whether we're using masks. I mean, it, it just made them, um, made it more clear to people. I mean, it wasn't an abstract argument. You know, here they want us to float, you know, they want an OB nurse to float to uh, surgery. You know, we can use you. You're just, you're just a number. You're just a widget. Thanks. Um, and and Troy, do you feel, or uh, Troy, do you do you want to weigh in at this point? Do you have a sense that the pandemic has changed what, you know, getting? I know you part of your work is getting people to sign up and join the union. Like, does the pandemic give you new ways in on that, or has changed? Do you think the project of organizing? Yeah, since the pandemic and when I started organizing, now it's a lot of phone calls, Zooms, uh, video chats. Recently, we just started a thing because our corporation thinks that they can't hire enough people to staff the building. So we came up with a solution. Uh, now I'm actually out in restaurants, door to door almost. Because before the pandemic, that's what people were doing. They, hey, knocking on doors and mobilizing and doing things like that. But after it, people are scared to, I mean, to even get sick. So it's changed a lot since the pandemic. But now I think we're headed in a different direction. I mean, people aren't as afraid anymore. And we are actually going door to door to mobilize to get people in our in our building. We are short maybe a hundred staff people and the corporation doesn't seem to care. They, what's your solution? How do you go about it? And we're fixing it for them because obviously they can. Well, sometimes workers have a better sense uh, of what is needed on the job than the boss does, right? Victoria's uh, spoken to that clearly and Troy, so have you. Um, tacking and. Um, the comments have been really, really interesting, and there's a variety of ways we can go on this. But I do want to return to the question that uh, Laura posed at the top, like what what makes this moment different? And I want to ask Troy, I'm going to put you on the spot again too. I am curious if you see um, or if you've detected the role that age plays in your campaign over these past few years, because and what I'm getting at is. Have you seen um, the role of younger people grow in the work that you're doing at the work site or maybe in the solidarity efforts that you've participated in? We've certainly seen that on, on uh, the Twitter feed, right? With Starbucks Workers United, for example, or the young people that are responsible for organizing JFK 8 um, with Amazon. I'm curious your experiences with MASH um, and this will also be directed towards James and Connor as well. So Troy. My experience with, with the age thing, I work with people from 80 down to 18. So there's generational gaps. There's all different types of people. And the older people are more stuck in their way. So you have to go about it differently. Uh, the younger people, you have to make them, you have to agitate them a little more to, to get them to, to make them want to move and make them want to care about something or speak out against things. So. It's just different ways to get at people, I guess, and I'm learning to still. But young people are, I don't want to say militant isn't the word, but they they are like, hey, I'm not putting up with that in no way I'm doing that. So it is totally different that way. Wonderful. Militant isn't a four-letter word. It's totally fine. <laughs> totally fine. Um, I do want to say um, before, uh, James and uh, Connor, before you jump in, I just wanted to point out that, um, James, you had said that you thought that young people like yourself and like Connor, I presume, have dormant support for unions. And I want to know um, if you can um, elaborate a little bit on that. And, and what do you think um, wakens that dormancy? Yeah, I think a lot of young people recognize the the importance of unions recognize the importance of collective bargaining etc um but there are 
a lot of people who grow up very privileged. And so they don't, they don't see the immediate need because they've, they've never personally experienced it. Um, and that's certainly true with a lot of uh, the people in our industry, because it's, it's a very college student um, staffed industry. Um, and I, I've just seen a lot of, of not quite as hurting people. Um, so, you know, they, they haven't had that immediate need for this kind of thing yet. Um, and that, that spark that, that makes them become an active, an active supporter is the getting out of college and getting their first job and seeing how, how messed up it really is and how not in their favor, the, the, the workforce the working conditions anywhere really are. Um, yeah, I hope that answered that. Yeah, I, I just want to jump in. Uh, I, I think, I think the 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 difficulties that workers face are so present in in our lives day to day. As I'm I'm 24 years old, um, I can't remember a time true truthfully in which social media wasn't ever present in my life. Uh, uh, you know, aside from a, a brief stint when I would have been too young to use it anyways. Um, we, we grow up being told that your life follows a, a specific path. You, you go to school, elementary school, through high school, you go to college, you go to college to get a job, you have your job to make money and pay rent. And then you wake up to do your job so that you can pay your rent for the next month. And I think the presence of the frustration and difficulties that workers face uh, being so publicly broadcast, being able to go onto Twitter and see that there are incredibly talented, uh, well-educated, uh, wonderful people working as nurses, and they're still struggling to uh, to to have a fair and safe work environment uh, is frustrating. I feel like we we are a generation and an age of people who are deeply frustrated. What's difficult is telling somebody now that frustration is present in your life. What are you going to do about it? And I think that that's the true challenge of getting young people involved and young people engaged is it, it is is telling them these solutions to these issues that you're seeing are not obvious and they're not they're not written out for you you have to find your solutions you have to put in the effort and the work to reach those solutions that's that's truly what is is going on now um, I, and, and I think it's I, I, like James said, it's dormant. It's there in, in most young people. And, and I think worker, I, I, I think bosses writ large are facing a, a, a true series of engagement uh, on a worker level. Uh, uh, Peter, the, the president of the Milwaukee area, Service and Hospitalities Workers Union always likes to say that that employers are facing a reckoning with young people right now, and I and I think that is incredibly true. Thank you for that, Connor, Victoria, and Mary. I'm curious how uh, you see age affecting the work that you do. Um, not only fighting for recognition, uh, Mary, but also Victoria fighting attrition um, within a unit in a private sector. Uh, right to work with a right to work employer. So um, please tell us your experiences. I found that the older nurses who have been at UW for a long time, who do know what it was like to be in a union and how great the working conditions were, are more nervous than the young folks. Um, they're convinced they're going to be fired, they'll lose their retirement. And there's been so, so many conversations that we've had um, 
you know, over the past years about that, which is, it's simply not true. Um, you know, they, they can't fire us. We're legally protected. Um, so it's harder to get through actually to the older nurses than to the younger nurses. I um, am really blown away by how um, invigorated, um, and I'll say these young kids, but I don't want to say that, are about the labor movement. And I'm inspired. Um, and I just hope that that continues because, I, yes, some it's dormant, but I've seen a lot of um, young kids really step up to the plate for better working rights for everybody and unions. Yeah, I I agree with Mary. Um, although uh, I think that it's been interesting in just even the last month, there's been maybe because of the PR that's going on. I mean, there's been young people who have specifically um, sought out Meritor because of the union. Like that was something that was a change. Um, so, you know, a couple of conversations I've had recently. Um, and uh, so, I mean, maybe it's, you know, just the context that we're in, you know, here in town with seeing UW and that struggle or, you know, the Starbucks baristas and being invigorated by that. I mean, I'm not sure. Delia and Frida, how has age impacted the work that you're doing at Clarion? Um, so, uh, Delia just ran to the restroom, but we had talked about this, uh, prior, um, in a way it's sort of, it's kind of been the opposite that, well, a mix of both. So the worker that really, um, kickstarted the entire campaign and got, got the workers connected to us at work of justice was the most recent hire. She'd been there for, um, only a few months when, uh, she reached out to us. And it sort of took like an outside perspective to realize these are these conditions aren't right. You can ask for more, especially because the rest of them uh, had been there for 10, 20 years. Um, so it was a mix of the um, people that had been there longer realizing, well, this is my job. I know more than all of the managers combined. Um, like that, uh, the ownership of their own job kind of, um, of knowing exactly what needs to be done, no, being an, an expert really, and realizing that because they'd been there so long that they could ask for so much more. And then the outside person saying, yeah, from other industries, yes, you, you can ask for more. So it was kind of a mixture of both of um, the younger folks bringing in like this outside perspective and the, the more experienced workers saying, well, who's going to be, you know, asking essentially the management, we've been there so long, who are, you, who are you going to find that will do this work better than we can? So realizing sort of their own power. That's a, that's a great, um, great theme across all of these about the ways that age is interacting and that, um, and, and perspective, right? The kind of perspective people are coming into jobs with. But uh, Victoria really named something that was gonna be the next the next question here. Um, this question of context, um, I feel like you can, I feel like there's kind of a, a virtuous cycle in some ways, or maybe, and I wonder if you experience it this way, that when organizing is going on, organizing, is easier to talk about or easier to do so that when people are reading about it, reading about Amazon or um, Starbucks, then when you come and ask them to sign a card or um, support something, does, and, 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 I, and I think I'm, I'm curious about your experience of that. Like, um, and I think I'd like to start with um, uh, Troy on this. Like, do you think the context, and then I know that, um, uh, Vic just sort of said that, but Mary, do you see that happening in the organizing around um, around the the vote um, and the action at UW? Like, so what are the, and, and all of you, you know, like how does the context of organizing actually change the way that you get to organize? Um, Troy, maybe start? Uh, I'm, 
I'm a little spoiled because at what I do, we have over 92% that are signed union dues members uh, at Levy. It's not hard to convince people that they should be treated fairly and have good paying jobs. And no matter what color, race or creed or sexual orientation they have, they, they should be treated fairly. And it's, it's easy actually once they're hired to get them in the door and they see what's going on when they say, Hey, you gotta have a seat at the table. They're going to listen to you. They're not going to treat you badly. So it's different. What happens to me at a lot of NEOs, which are new employee orientations, I do those as well. Like say act 10 happened and we get people that come in and do jobs and they've had bad experiences with unions and they come across and you'd be like, man, I, I hate that that happened to you, but this is what we're doing here. So like I said, I'm pretty spoiled in that manner. And it's, it's easy to get people to jump on board when they're going to be treated fairly. Um, so it's really hard at UW <laughs> to, um, <laughs> to talk to uh, new employees, especially the employees that came in after uh, 2014 when our union contract dissolved. Um, it's like I mentioned before with the old folks are too afraid, but um, the newer uh, nurses, they have to, <laughs> we have to do so much comparison from before versus now. Um, we, so we've done a lot of literature, um, just explaining like the cuts that we have taken over the years and, um, just trying to walk through bit by bit, conversation by conversation to get people motivated. And yeah, I use, um, you know, it's the labor movement is coming back. I use that a lot and you know, I think it's working. We've got a majority of people signed cards. So, uh, but it, it has been hard. It's not easy, Troy. I wish I worked where you did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, the other thing when we were in our um, contract negotiation, I mean, the other positive spin with it is the solidarity, you know, that we felt. I mean, so much gets siloed where I, in my workplace, um, and, you know, when we were doing this, you know, having the um, the Teamsters, uh, you know, having union, you know, it, just the community support with that. I mean, that that brought so much more context, as it were, or whatever, you know, that just made things so much more connected. I think that's the other thing with organizing, you know, um, that they want to do is divide everybody. And so trying to work against that, and I, that's been a constant struggle uh, where I'm at, that feeling of being connected to something. Um, yeah, I agree with you, uh, Victoria. It's, I keep saying to people, you know, you can break a stick, but you can't break a bundle. We need to stay together on here. And so hopefully it works. <laughs> I wonder if uh, Dahlia or James or Connor have thoughts about this moment in the context. And then I think we'll be um, kind of opening it up after we get this response on this like last thoughts on this moment. Yeah, I can definitely speak to the context. Um, when we were getting our coworkers to sign authorization cards and sign up for the union um, before we went public, we were absolutely using Collectivo here in Milwaukee. Um, that has been a huge local one, as well as of course, Starbucks and Amazon. But Collectivo was definitely the most poignant, at least for me, um, because we work closely with Collectivo. Collectivo baristas work at our venues, uh, barista ing for uh, artists and one of our venues in the back room of Collectivo. So using that uh, helped immensely to, to get people on board for, for our organizing, for sure. 
Wonderful. Thanks so much for that, James. Yes. Um, success or wins breed success and wins. They certain, certainly uh, breed confidence, right? Um, and a, a sense of your own power, which you all have been talking about uh, so far. But right now we are going to open um, things up to the audience. If any of you have any questions, please feel free to type them in the chat. Um, you can already see that uh, a fellow attendant has already done so, Jed, who has a question for Mary, but I think that it can be applied also um, elsewhere, um, thinking about um, the brand of your employer, be it the university, um, or, you know, uh, Paps Theater Group or Clarion Hotels, how that has a role um, or what sort of role that plays in recruiting new members. Um, Jed writes that he knows that at the University of Kentucky, that the University of Kentucky brand carries such a heavy weight and many are, uh, seem scared to push back against what that brand is in the community. So Mary and others, if um, anyone wants to weigh in. Um I don't feel like the University of Wisconsin bears any weight on pushback. Um, the UW worked fantastic, um, you know, since the seventies up until Act Ten, with a you know good working relationship with SEIU and the nurses' union and the other unions that were in the hospital. Um, so I don't know. I guess I've never really thought about the brand, but look, they're doing nothing to um, attract or keep nurses there. And um, I don't know, what was the follow-up? Is that follow-up question for me too? I'm on my phone, so I can't really see my chat. That's okay. No, that was that was great. That was perfect. Anyone else? Does anyone else okay. have a sense of the, the impact your employer's brand might have on your ability to attract new members? Or conversely, which is something that actually uh, Victoria said earlier, the presence of a union in your shop, does that attract new workers uh, who, who might actually would have thought to uh, pursue employment elsewhere? How, how does that impact the work that you guys are doing? Yeah, I think, uh, I, I think that um, in, in our case with the Paps Theater Group uh, and, uh, and our union uh, that we've formed there, um, I think ultimately, uh, for a lot of us, again, we do have a deep passion for this industry. Um, I think that at first was a little bit frightening um, to be to be going against, so to speak, the uh, the company that honestly, uh, and this is no offense to Pfizer Forum, but uh, currently dominates the entertainment industry in in Milwaukee. Uh, uh, our theaters, Paps Theater, Riverside Theater, those are those are landmark theaters that people know about from all over the state and want to attend uh, shows at. It it definitely was something that I think a lot of us felt as we were organizing. Uh, do we, uh, you know, do do we have uh, the the authority that we hope to have? And I think ultimately uh, that that's something that we've shaken off. I think, I think regardless of weight of a brand or, uh, or, or presence in an industry that, that a company has, nothing changes the fact that you deserve to have comfort in the place you work. And I think that, I think, I think that was difficult to explain to people, but I think moving forward, uh, that sort of, uh, inverse effect that you talked about it is going to be ever present. I think I think having a union um, that is so unique in a in a in a space in an industry that does not have these types of union as commonplace, um, I think it's only going to attract more people to our industry and attract more people to our business. Honor Victoria, the brand issue where in my workplace is, you know, the being part of a corporate healthcare system. And it's this age thing that I think the older coworkers of mine push back against that because they remember, we remember the community hospital, it being an intimate 
community hospital, people remember, you know, ah, my, you know, my grandchildren were born here. And then now having um, directives out of state. Um, you know, we, we're bargaining against HR, but, you know, the line is not even coming from across the table. It's coming from Iowa or wherever. So, it, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Go. Sorry. No, 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 no. I'm done. <laughs> okay. Uh, Frida and Delia. Yeah. So, um, the, with the hotel industry, I think it's kind of unique because there's the corporate run hotels and then there's the hotels that are run by management companies. And so there's a completely different culture in either. The, ho the hotels that are run by directly by the corporation are tightly run. The wages are extremely high for the industry, but they also require often like a degree in hospitality versus the, the other hotels are kind of whatever whoever the highest bidder is in terms of a, a management company. And so the, the corporation is not keeping a close eye on those the way they are with the, the flagship hotels in major cities. Um, and um, the benefits are vastly different. The, the surveillance is also vastly different, but it's also um, the, the, the barrier of entry for unionizing those um, non-corporate hotels is lower because you don't have to go directly to the corporation. You just go with against the management company, the, the ones that are below them. Um, and so you're still messing with the brand image, the corporate image, but the general public doesn't know that Clarion is run by SNL uh, hospitality, right? It's not a, it's not a recognizable brand, uh, but going against, by going against both, by going against really SNL, you're going against the corporate too, and you can raise the standards of the entire hotel. So they're comparable to those that are flagship hotels. So it's kind of like a weird, um, to an outsider, to someone not in the industry, this is a hotel, but it's a vastly different culture. Um, and potentially by raising the voice on this one particular hotel that is not corporately run, It'll steer people away from the corporately run, corporately run ones as well. Thanks so much. Since we are um, getting short on time, uh, and it doesn't appear to have any uh, audience questions, well, maybe maybe not in the queue. Um, I will ask one final question uh, so that Laura can close us out, which is um, to all of you, um, and and please just jump in. If someone on this call is either interested in organizing their own workplace or knows somebody who, who is thinking about it, what's one piece of advice you'd give them? So um, I am going to put Victoria on the spot first. Victoria. Um, well, I think a piece of advice is don't give up. You know, I mean, uh, victories are a relative thing. And, um, you know, it, if not giving up and, and just uh, listening, you know, I think one of the biggest things in right to work is still having one on one conversations, you know, the basics. And don't give up. Great. One on ones. There's no shortcut. Troy. Yeah, I'd, I'd say uh, just be persistent because I didn't actually choose this. I was chosen because organizers before me just kept on, kept on, kept on, kept on until I was just like, okay, let me go to a meeting. Let me see what it's about. And and it stuck. I mean, pers persistent pays off. And if you keep at it, it'll, it'll work out for you in the end. Wonderful. Thank you, Connor. Yeah, um, I think my big piece of advice is that uh, frustration is a incredibly strong weapon that spreads rapidly. Um, and, and, and I think reassuring folks that their frustrations are not theirs alone. Um, man, that that does a lot for for a worker who's who's insecure or, or unsure of how they can actually make a difference. 
Thank you. Uh, Frida and Delia, your piece of advice? Uh, Delia mentioned, yes, uh, just continue all the way to the end. Um, uh, don't stop midway. Um, uh, and I'd also add, um, to especially the workers that we're organizing that feel like they're the first, um, they're like, they're only like, they're the only immigrant workers to organize that they're not. And it's in their cultural heritage from all the way back home in Mexico, that this is a legacy that they continue even far away from home. Thank you for that, James. I think um, using using the context that we talked about, about how there are so many other workplaces that are organizing and have organized is a very, very powerful tool in organizing your own workplace. Uh, so assuring, like Connor said, assuring that that their frustrations are not are, are not in a vacuum. Um, and that the frustrations at this workplace are not in a vacuum, that it's it's so much more global. Um, that gives people a lot of assurance and confidence that that their cause is a, not to sound dramatic, but a righteous one. <laughs> Wonderful. And Mary, you get the last word since you are neck deep in organizing a monumental um, effort next week. It takes a long time and you need a ton of patience um yeah just conversation by conversation chris smalls came to one of our uh, wednesday night organizing meetings and he said you wake up every day it's a new day you have the same conversations over and over and you just keep going so it'll be worth it in the end and i hope to see you guys all on the picket line next week please join us <laughs> I'm so um I'm so thrilled to have uh gotten to be with each with this you know these panelists and get to learn from you. I want to just close out a few things. Um if any press on the call need to get folk get in touch with panelists, you can find them through the call, but also I can help uh facilitate that. So be in touch with me or others at cows and we can get you to to people um i wanted uh really to say that that one of the things that i hear so loudly i um is that seeing each other is partly how we see our power and how we imagine something different right and and so um you know how you see each other on, on your jobs uh in your work sites in your campaigns um, I really honor, but I also want to say that the more we see each other um, in spaces like this and that we see the work going on at Clarion or PTG or UW Health, um, just across the board, uh, Meritor uh, and, and um, Buck Stadium, like all of this is the work of seeing each other and um, rising up standards in the slave market. And I'm just uh, uh, honored to have gotten to, to be with you all for it. So um, I think with that, uh, we'll end just a few minutes early, but um, I wanted to just kind of close it down with that. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much, everyone. Solidarity to all of those uh, who participated today. Keep up the great work.